a panel discussion with a number of medical experts who are going to respond to some of the things that uh, Baroness uh, Finley has said and also explore the Irish context, context of this issue. Our panel chair is Dr. Miriam Colloran, who completed specialist palliative med uh, medicine training in Ireland and is a consultant in palliative medicine in St. Bridges Hospice and NACE Generous Hospital. Uh, Nace General Hospital. <laughs> and because it's shocked in the Gaelga, and I've heard she speaks fluent Irish, I'm going to say, dig with Miriam. Oh, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. Thanks very much, Steve. Yeah. Uh, um, so I suppose we're all palliative care doctors here. Um, we're all palliative care doctors here, and it's wonderful to get to, ch to chat with you all. But what what is palliative care? Sarah, would you like maybe to share with us what palliative care is? Oh, yeah. apologies, my gosh, I'm so sorry. I should I should introduce you first, oh dear. I need more tea. Uh, uh, Dr. Sarah McLean is a consultant in palliative medicine and she tra tra trained in Ireland and um, Ireland and London and New York and is currently working in St. in St. Vincent's private hospital and Dr. Faith Cranfield is uh, Dr. Faith Cranfield is a consultant in palliative medicine again trained in Ireland and Ireland in Australia and uh, St. Francis Hospice Blanchardstown and Connolly Hospital are extremely lucky to have her working there with them. I'm so sorry guys I know them so well I automatically jumped into having a chat. I'm so sorry. A apologies. So, so Sarah you you were going to share with us what palliative, and of course, um, I, Laura has kindly is staying with us as well to discuss, which is wonderful. Uh, Sarah, would you explain to us what palliative care is? Gosh, thanks, Miriam, and um, Baroness Laura. Thank you for an amazing talk that was really oh, so inspiring and, and interesting. Um, and Miriam, I suppose like we all know what, what palliative care, palliative medicine is, but I suppose how I explain it to my patients is that we are you know, we look after patients' physical symptoms and, and look after their day-to-day -day quality of life, of course. Um, we're really not only about the patient, we're really about the people minding them, their family and loved ones. And I think what sets palliative medicine apart sometimes is that we really are, we're focused on the day-to-day, -day, but I think an important part of what we do is we think about what is meaningful and important to, to the patient themselves and think about the future. And a lot of what I emphasize with my patients is that we're here to work with them, to think about their goals, what they want their care to look like and how we can work with all the other doctors and people looking after them to achieve that. Um, and that's how I sum it up to my patients when I, when I meet them for the first time. Oh, very good. And, and, and what drew you to palliative care as a speciality, Sarah? Um, well, I suppose I started in my very early training, I was working in haematology and um, in a bone marrow transplant unit, and I found it incredibly difficult to um, see patients going through these really, really difficult treatments that weren't always successful. Um, and I suppose I was just drawn to the, the communication piece and, and um, getting to know families. Um, and I didn't like the lab so much. <laughs> so that kind of um, was what drew me to palliative care. And I think the thing that I love about palliative care is that, um, you know, I think every subspecialty now thinks that they can do things that other people can't. But I think this is in palliative medicine, really when, when all is lost and people think there's nothing else that can be done, we can say, well, actually, you know, there's always something that we can do. And I think that's what makes it so satisfying for me. Oh, wonderful. And Elora, may I ask you what, what drew you to palliative? Well, actually fairly similarly, but I, I, I'm of the days before the specialty existed. <laughs> That's uh, the, And I decided to jump ship from uh, paediatrics and general practice because I just, actually I was angry at seeing bad care. That's what drove me. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do something about it. And so um, I became the first consultant in Wales and um, the rest has gone on from there. But I thought if we could change things a little bit in one place, we could be like the ripples on the pond and improve it. I was inspired by Cicely Saunders. Yes. If I might just say, though, I think that something very important happened in the last year during COVID. Palliative care has completely come of age. People suddenly realise there isn't any certainty there is uncertainty across the whole of medicine. You have young people come in and just die in front of doctor's eyes. And you have 
other people who people are, who they've struggled and struggled with and thought we're we're not going to get this person through but they keep trying and lo and behold they yes. do come through yes. but in that palliative care has been working in parallel sure. with these other services teaching them how to break bad news gently how to deal with a young parent dying leaving a child bereaved and all of those lessons have suddenly been picked up across healthcare because the message is we just don't know what's going to happen yes. we try our best but we don't chuck the towel in on patients and give up sure. on them sure sure it really has co the covid pandemic really has brought uncertainty to the fore yeah. and ha has has i think it's fair to say that it has raised death awareness and the fr the fragility of life and the unpredictability yeah. yes absolutely thank you baroness um and faith for you what drew you to pa palliative I was lucky. Um, palliative care was somewhat established when I was a medical student. So I know you're boasting that you're so much younger than the rest of us. <laughs> so I, I just happened to have a rotation in it. And it was the first time as a medical student that I was encouraged to get to know the person. And mm. that resonated. I wanted oh. to know okay. what made people tick. I was interested yeah. in people. That's why I did medicine. Um, what made people tick and what mattered to them? And that essentially is the essence of a palliative care doctor. When I go and meet someone, yes. I'm not there to talk about dying, although they often fear meeting me. Sure. Um, in fact, I'm there to go and find out about them, what's important to them, and what can I do to make sure that they're yes. feeling as much themselves as possible. Yes. Because the Thank illness you. will take that away. You know, all of a sudden, you, you will not be able to go back to work because health has taken over and you're going to hospitals and you might mind your grandchild. And, you know, you can feel a real sense mm. of loss of yourself. Um, and our job is to try and help people regain that sense of self and that sense of control. Yeah. And, yeah. and by and large, that, that, that is exactly what happens. Sure. Um, and so I enjoy that. Yes. And it's, so it's really what, what I'm hearing from everyone really is about palliative being about helping someone live their best life for as long as possible and as well as possible. And that it's very much tailored to the particular person, to what their hopes and wishes and needs and aspirations are, that it's very much about person centred care and meeting the patient where they're at. Yeah. Can I just say, interestingly, yeah. when you meet other doctors, they'll all say, you know, why would you do palliative medicine? I mean, <laughs> You're never going to make them well you know you're not going to make a difference but to me the difference is palpable you know someday one person can't go out for a meal because well they can't go out anyway now but they can't go out for a meal because because their nausea is not well controlled yes. so they can't enjoy a family celebration yes. i know how to manage nausea so yes. they'll go for their family celebration it's measurable and it clearly makes a difference sure very much focusing on the person as a person absolutely absolutely Th thank you all for that. And, and I suppose the other thing that comes to mind then is, oh, sorry, apologies. Um, no, I just wanted to add yes. to that, actually, yes. what they said, because the other thing is that we are helping people make good memories. Yes. So that those who are bereaved, who live with what's happened, don't have bad memories, but they have OK memories. And I've been struck at the number of fast track weddings that, that palliative care has arranged during mm -hmm. COVID. Sure, sure. Yes, it's it, yeah. That's so important because, uh, and I suppose for what, what you're saying there, um, Bar Barnasay, is so important because we know that loved ones coped better in bereavement when they feel that the the person that they're that their deceased loved one that their symptom control was managed well and that they were as comfortable as possible, but also that their needs and worries were met. Yeah. And their dignity was enhanced, and they were looked after and appreciated as the person of value. Yes, and of course they are. Absolutely. Every person is of intrinsic value. Um, so so I, I suppose that what's striking me, and I'm, I'm very conscious that, and I, as we all are, that we're discussing here um, uh, assisted suicide and, uh, and, and assisted dying, is it tends to be a, a global term encompassing assisted suicide in euthanasia. And this uh, bill is specifically, Bill on Boss Um Dignitu, uh, the Dying with Dignity Bill, is specifically about legalizing assisted suicide and euthanasia, the directive administration of medication by a doctor or actually a nurse under this bill, uh, because it can, uh, um, uh, to, to a person, to hasten their death, to cause them to die. But, but Faith, I'm, I'm mindful that this is actually what you did your MSc, MSc dissertation on. C could you share a little bit about that with us, please? So I did a master's in healthcare ethics and law just because I thought it was interesting. I thought ethical, um, the, 
the ethical situations we found ourselves in at work were interesting and challenging. Um, and I hummed and hawed about doing a dissertation on youth in Asian assisted suicide because in reality, it, it's not something that, that matters to the vast majority of people that I look after and that I care for. It's not actually um, relevant to them. It's not something they want. They want to live, but they want to live better than they were when they met me, feeling better. Um, but I just thought, you know, it was in several jurisdictions and it was growing and I thought that it is associated with end of life and therefore I ought to be well versed on it and understand it better from both sides. Um, so I, I had instinctive views on it that it was uh, not safe, but um, I decided to just inform myself and learn about it. Um, cause I'm very much somebody who believes to live and let live, but you know, and everybody's different and everybody makes their own choices and that's fine. Um, but I settled at the end of my dissertation on what we've said today, which is that it's, it's just not safe for so many people. Um, so many people are put at risk by introducing this lacuna, this, this change in the legislation for a very small number of people to who, who, who could not imagine that there is any other solution to the distress okay. that they find themselves okay. in. Okay. Um, and that was my conclusion, but I, was, I could go on about it for hours. Okay, well, well, maybe we will go on and talk about it a little bit more. And, and I suppose what, what's underlying this, what, I, what, what I'm hearing from you all from, and from everyone so far and, uh, is, is that this is about our aim is we want to provide compassionate care uh, for persons who have advanced progressive illness, for persons, well, for all our patients, but in particular, we're discussing today persons with typically who have stage four disease, who have incurable illnesses, incurable advanced progressive illnesses, that we want to provide compassionate care for them. But we're healthcare workers, we're all doctors here. Um, so compassionate care, we also want to provide safe patient care. So patient safety has to be of paramount importance to us too. And it's part of that, a really important part of that picture. And I think while we're talking about patient safety, I will just come to a misunderstanding about the use of opiates. That's morphine family medicines in hospice and in palliative care. I, I, we've all heard um, that morphine kills. I even remember my own mother saying to me years ago that morphine caused people to die sooner. And that myth is still out there, unfortunately. Thankfully, there's a lot of research and evidence to show that the use of opioids, and again, that's morphine and morphine family medicine used properly and used in palliative care do not hasten death. And I know Hope Ireland are kindly going to share research and literature on their website about this. So given that we know that opiates are safe, are used safely in a hospice and a palliative care context, um, maybe can we chat about other aspects of patient safety uh, it, that we're concerned about in terms of assisted suicide and euthanasia? Um, Sarah, would you like to start? Uh, yeah, thanks, Miriam. And I think, you know, coming back to um, the inherent flaws in this bill, mm -hmm. um, and I was listening to Gino Kenny, one of the politicians who, you know, who's bringing this bill to, and he keeps saying on the radio, you know, this bill, it needs extensive redrafting, it needs extensive revisions, but like he's acknowledging that it, the flaws yeah. in the bill, you know, which just tells me inherently that, um, he acknowledges himself the flaws in this bill. It is an unsafe bill and the safeguards in the bill are just not there. You know, there's no um, requirement um, for a mental health assessment mm -hmm. for patients, you know, no requirements that their depression is managed or their anxiety is yeah. managed. Yeah. Um, really the capacity, you know, the assessing people to make sure that they have the capacity to make um, decisions for themselves is not robust and um, the oversights um, built into the bill, you know, there's no mechanism to ensure that um, even the, the frequency with which this legislation might be used is reported or mm -hmm. you know, scrutinized. Um, so it's just a really unsafe bill and that's at the level of the bill. And then at the level of the individual patient, you know, this is just such an unsafe um, practice because um, as we've alluded to already, you know, the definition of, of terminal illness in the bill is just too broad. There's mm -hmm. no um, yeah. even prognosis, although obviously prognostication is very difficult. Mm -hmm. But 
um, the definition of terminal illness is too broad and um, at the level of, of the patient, you know, we know that patients yes. feel as though they're a burden and um, there are just no safeguards that can be put in place to sure. ensure that patients aren't coerced into, into, into requesting this. Sure. Yes, sadly, I mean, it's something that we all hear as, as doctors, as nurses and social workers and palliative care chaplains, we all sadly hear patients talking about a fear of being a burden to their family and to their loved ones. And we know that 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 may, the family may feel very very differently, but there is that that fear that patients can have. And I suppose, uh, exactly as you're saying there, Sarah, our concern would be that the right to die can be can, that the the right to die can become the duty to die when assisted suicide and assisted and, and euthanasia are legalised. Um, uh, Elora, would you like to um, to share with us? Yeah, I, I think there are also some other dangers, uh, which we haven't even mentioned, uh, and that is diagnostic errors. The select committee that I was on heard from the College of Pathologists that at post-mortem, about one in 20 people didn't die of what was written on the death certificate and was thought to be a terminal illness. You know, we, we get things wrong. We get diagnosis wrong. It isn't only prognosis that, that we've got wrong. I, I mean, my, if you like, my longest survivor is somebody who I thought back in 1991 had a prognosis of three months. Sure. And he sent me a text message a few months, a few weeks ago, it was in January actually, to see if I was okay and had escaped COVID. <sighs> Isn't that you know, so beautiful? Yeah. But, but in the meantime, his own wife died and he had to bring up his three children on his own as a single parent. Yes. You, you just can't tell. The other thing is we in palliative care like to get to know our patients. We want to get to know the family. We still don't know what goes on behind closed doors. That's and I've had, I've, sadly, I've been completely taken in by families sometimes who I thought were loving, caring families, but they weren't so loving when the fixed term life insurance policy ran out. It, 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 and it, and that, sure. you know, or when the will, once the will had been changed. Sure. I mean, sure. I'm afraid, you know, that, and we just don't know. We don't sure. detect that coercion. Sure. Sure. And, and, and what you're saying, I, I think, is so important uh, and is so important because overt can overt co coercion may be picked up but there is that coercion behind the back doors that we may not pick up at all and this is I irreversible uh, ending a person's life hastening a death is is irreversible it's um i absolutely it's a huge worry a huge worry and uh, faith yes no, i was gonna say if we go back to coercion yes change the legislation that's not a coercion but it is it changing the environment in which somebody is making a decision. So if I temporarily feel, oh my goodness, like I had a lady, okay, she was in her 60s, a strong maternal, maternal woman who became less well and needed help as a okay. result of her cancer. And the biggest thing that had been important in that family's life was going to be the wedding of her daughter. Yes. And that was all sort of put to one side and they didn't know whether to talk about it or not talk about it. And sure. she, she, she just wanted to be out of the way. She felt she was a burden and she just was very, very distressed. Oh. Couldn't talk about it. She wanted to protect them and, and really just thought it'd be much better if she just wasn't there at all was, and was incredibly distressed. Yes. And, you know, once we were able to facilitate a conversation between them and to give it sufficient supports to minimize the impact on the family around her to make her feel as independent as possible, it was very clear that her daughter didn't want to have at all. She would have been devastated. She sure. moved the wedding forward and they celebrate, like, like Bernard and um, Laura said, mm -hmm. um, they moved the wedding forward and they celebrated that. Had the environment in which we lived been, well, you know, that's a perfectly respectable decision and we should follow yes. that. Mm -hmm. That becomes the goal. That could potentially, you can imagine, become the goal for this lady yes. and take away from, from everything else. Yes. And people rationally will feel, oh, yes, we're respecting her. That's fine. Yes. But there's such, um, such an opportunity for connection and for, for making memories and for living that's gone. Yeah, no, but, but, yeah absolutely. It's not coercion, but it's sure. it changing the environment in which you make a decision. Now, we all know any marketing person will tell you the yes. environment in which you are affects the choices that you make. Sure, sure, sure. Um, is it? Is it? Is it? Is it? Is it? Um, I'm hearing about fear. 
even though we're not naming it, about fear of change and fear of what I suppose our society and, and we're we're embedded in a, in a Western society which very much values independence and and actually uh, kind of there's a stigma to looking for help and seeking help and the help of others. Is there is there something about this in assisted dying and assisted suicide and euthanasia? I think if we look at the evidence from places, yes, there is. And actually loneliness. I mean, it seems uh, horrific that there are cases of euthanasia which had been because the person wasn't coping with lockdown. Yeah. Uh, loneliness comes kind of hand in hand with this excessive control and autonomy that we look for because we've forgotten the value of relationships. Um, so I, I think I think there is something there that's really very worrying. And the burden of choice, of course, this isn't about choice. It is that you may be offered less choice okay. because the choices are less in the care that you get. And you have this hanging over you. When should I go? When should I decide to be dead? Okay. Rather then actually I'm going to carry on living as well as I can, accept the help and support to let me do that. Everyone, I mean, we talk about a right to die. We're all going to die. I'd love to know who's got the right to not die. <laughs> what you're talking about is you're wanting some people to have a right for somebody else to kill them yes. or give them the means to commit suicide. Yeah. And we have suicide prevention for good reason. Mm -hmm. And we yeah. make a hole in that at our peril. Yeah, I, I think what you're saying is really important. And I say, see, Steve has joined us. Um, Steve, Steve has joined us. Is it OK, Steve, if we just ask one question in terms of, and, and it can feed into the Q&A as well. How have yeah. you, how have you, um, Elora, how have you dealt with this for me? Because, of course, we're embedded in the Irish political system. Mm. How have you dealt this from a UK political perspective? Well, we've had bills put before us in Parliament and they've been, they've had massive campaigns behind us. The campaigners will carry on. I think the thing that's worrying is that you have a complex problem and the bill is put up as a simplistic solution to a complex problem okay. that runs right across society. And the problem in society is actually how do we change attitudes to look after people well? How do we value people? We have legislation about equality, about disability rights, but it isn't applied to every single person. We hear about discrimination. We hear about domestic abuse behind closed doors. We hear about elder abuse, financial abuse, and so on. But what we found was when it actually came to it and people went into it in detail, they went, oh, this is too dangerous. This is this is too dangerous. And so the last time it came before us, it, it was lost. The, the vote was lost pretty resoundingly. And I think you do have to say, if you're going to change the law, is what you're going to change it to safer for everybody? Because the law must protect the whole population. So we don't actually, all our laws are really protective. Um, and we make holes in them to allow some things. Okay, thank you. Now, I, I might come in here and um, wh while you're all there, I, the first question that I'm going to read out is, uh, is actually just a thanks to all of you. Um, from Monia, who said, I witnessed firsthand the incredible efforts of the palliative care doctors and care team during the last weeks of my mother's life. I want to thank the incredible doctors on this conference today who are standing up for her rights and others like her who want to live with dignity as long as they can. So thank you uh, to all of you for that. There's also a thanks to Connor, um, uh, which um, could I just con join in congratulating Connor for his extraordinary life and life achievements and for being so articulate and passionate in, expression, in expressing our shared concerns in relation to this proposed bill. So thank you to you, Connor. Um, now, there, there are so many questions coming in. We're not gonna have time for all of them. We will have a, uh, some time later on also um, to take questions. Um, 
but I'd like to ask you, you, how can we better reach out to people to ensure they don't feel like a burden or become too upset about the debate taking place in the media? Anyone want to take that? I think that we actually need to be quite upfront and open that there is help and support available and this is how you get it. And all of the services for people, not just palliative care, but all the disability services everywhere, have to say, am I fulfilling my duty to my fellow citizen? Am I available 24 seven? Because people hit rock bottom in the, in the night, at bank holidays and weekends, not nine to five, Monday to Friday. And if you're going to look after somebody, you've got to be available. So actually, that's where we should be putting our efforts and supporting people to live well, because then they can contribute back in society. You know, Baroness Campbell's the absolute classic example, terminally ill for nearly the whole of her adult life, and yet contributed more to disability, disability rights probably than anybody else. And Tani Gray Thompson, who I work with in the House of Lords very closely, who's the Paralympian of all Paralympians, really. Mm -hmm. Yes, and who spoke to us at the last conference and, and her, her story was really very inspiring, I have to say. Um, now, just to, I, I'm keeping an eye on the time and, and we are hoping to leave some time at the end of the conference also for Q&A. Um, so we're going, to, we're going to move on now. My thanks to Dr. Maria McCallaghan and her panelists Dr. Faith Cranfield and Dr. Sarah McLean for that very informative discussion um, and, and with Bar Baroness Laura Finlay um, on some of the medical implications of any le legislation around euthanasia and assisted suicide. Um, now, if, 